Hi, Matt. Hello, Jason. So we're here to talk about Mencius Bulbugs, Patchwork, a political system for the 21st century. Uh, Curtis Yarvin, a.k.a. Mencius Bulbug, uh, has been uh, having a bit of a springtime, springtime for Hitler moment uh, <laughs> recently. He's uh, popping up everywhere. Just recently he was on uh, Chuck Dirk or uh, Charlie Kirk. Uh, did you listen to that? I did. I was losing my mind by the end of it. I know, eh? I okay. was like... Okay, let's they... talk about this for a second. Let's okay, please. yes. Let's talk about this for a second. <laughs> it's, so, it's so surreal, right? Uh-huh. I've never listened to Charlie Kirk. Me I know who he is. I know who he is. I've seen him do speeches for Turning Point USA and whatever. Like Are that. you with like, high school? Oh, you're, yeah, you're a little political animal and cool, whatever, right? Like, not my, I'm not American, not my deal, whatever. And, but I've never listened to his podcast, so so this is, I was, I, was, I did, I did, I didn't know what to expect, but yet I was, but I was satisfied with my expectations. Does that make sense? So this sort of like, yeah. I didn't know what it was going to be, but I was like, this is exactly what it was going to be. Like, of course, it, this is how it's going to go. Um, go ahead. <laughs> what were your impressions? He, so, first of all, I was trying to look up real quick here. I wanted to see if... Uh, um, uh, Anyone who doesn't know what we're talking about, you can go check out the Charlie Kirk show. Uh, it's on... I, I listen to it on Apple Podcast. Uh, mm -hmm. The title of the episode is uh, The Real Way to Dismantle the... Excuse me. The the real way to dismantle the deep state. To, uh, the real way to dismantle the deep state with Curtis Yarvin. It's a Charlie Kirk show, yeah. Yes. So I'm looking here to see. I'm looking on Apple Podcasts to see what his. To, I, was, I wanted to look at the uh, the uh, podcast rankings to see where he is oh, yeah. on there. Um, but it's not. Things aren't pulling up the way I was expecting you to. It, it, needless to say. He's got a very large audience. This is like just about as close to mainstream conservatism as you can possibly get. Just neocon drivel. Just, just, just well, the. My perception of him is he's like the millennial conservative. Like he's yes. a conservative. You know, came up through the univer when university thing and like, oh, free speech and you know, yep. not letting Milo on and all that stuff. Um, so from like 2014, 2012, 2014 on up that's where he made his his presence that's where his whole stick is and he's very millennial in that yes. really hyper annoying middle management kind yes. of presentation with a big giant head and, and tiny little face it's very strange <laughs> so he's like it's always been basically just the really uh, dry run of the mill normie conservatism just just idealism out the yahoo and just totally detached from reality and but he's actually turned himself into a pretty decent little political operative. He's I mean, he has the ear of presidents. He's sitting in boards. You know, he's 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 very much uh, within the heart of the regime and which has been kind of part of the reason why I've just never really cared about him. But I'm sitting here listening to Yarvin. And first of all, like if you've listened to Yarvin before, this is one of the best like Yarvin is improving as he does more and more interviews. This was one of this. I, having listened to basically every Yarvin interview that's ever been done, I've I, I've heard him go at these things from all sorts of different angles. So I can tell when he's tailoring tailoring his message to the audience. And he had the audience. I, I guarantee I'm sitting here listening to this as like a boomer con, and just like, wow, this is the the way he framed it was like so they could barely object to what he's saying, and he is dropping just some absolutely massive red pills for lack of a better term. And then, and then Charlie says he's spent the last summer with Michael fucking Anton studying Machiavelli and he's raving about Machiavelli. I was like, okay, Chuck, you, you hats off to you. He's dropping like historical references. I've never even heard before. And, and he, what was fascinating is in, in over the course of the conversation, Yarvin's talking about some like serious stuff, like saying the your 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 the only value of your vote is to take that vote and cede all of the power to one person. That's the what that's the one bit of power you can get with your vote, and that the time comes where you just need to essentially 
There's democracy, which functions as oligarchy. And eventually you get to the point where you just need to use a big democratic effort to get a single monarch. And then he's going to go in there and, and function as a monarch. And he, but Charlie was pushing back on him in really interesting ways where it sounded to me like Charlie is, is like fully in alignment with him, but he's sort of playing devil's advocate a little bit and pressing him on stuff that he knows would be hangups for his audience so that then, it, and it just reinforced everything Curtis was saying. I was, I was mind blown listening to it. What is amazing is that, yeah, like, like you said, I listened to Yarvin. I remember he was on the Deleuze something or other, um, was one of the first full, like he was a, it was a public speaking event at some college or something like that. And that was when he was in the full, um, uh, mm, uh, mm -hmm. and I was, I remember sending this out to like Mark and a few other people and they're like, I can't listen to this guy. It's uh -huh. I'm like, yeah, I know you have to get through the ums and yas, but like, if you, if you parse that out and listen to what this guy's saying, it's, it's, it's revolutionary. Like it's, it, it's, it's a, it's a way forward that we, I don't think we're, that you're never going to hear from anyone in the political class currently, even like you're more out there jordan peterson's at the time or whoever no one's thinking this or putting this together in this in this package and he's gone from that to this and i feel like this is it's this was even more polished and more precise than the tucker one than the tucker mm -hmm. uh, conversation yeah the tucker conversation was still more classic yarvin uh and he was i think being a bit cagier this one is like it's like his, he he came in with a very clear understanding of of who he's talking to, how he needs to talk to them, and who the audience is. Mm -hmm. What was killing me was the was Yarvin doing the the uh, repetitions. Like uh, uh, Charlie would butt in and say something and, and say I don't know whatever. Like the sky is blue, and and, and Yarvin would be like yes, the sky is blue now. And then he would like just. Uh -huh. You just like, confirm and move, confirm and move, and it happens so many times that I'm like, Chef's kiss. Yes, because like, like, I couldn't, I couldn't have done that. Like, I couldn't. I'm, I'm trying to learn this stuff, uh, for whatever future of this that we have. But like, I listen to like that. That's a master class in receiving, understanding, uh, confirming, mm -hmm. and then moving on. You know who Never else is really good at that? Mm. unsurprisingly vivek ramaswamy yes that's yeah funny enough you were doing a we'll get to the reading eventually folks don't worry um uh go 1.5 speed if you really have to it's, it's fine uh Rookie we numbers. uh you you were reading out in the in the king pill discord that everyone should go join well i'll put links in the in the uh in the uh description below come join us for some weird wacky conversations and some projects that may be uh turning into something For, forthcoming uh which is maybe why we're reading this in the first place we'll just tease you a little bit uh you were reading out a transcript from vivek on remind me he was sean ryan show of, yeah i tried watching it sean ryan's an interesting guy uh like it's that whole show is those shows always mystify me a little bit like it's like why can't I stomach doing that? I could do that. I know <laughs> how it's done. Like it would be really easy in some ways. It's not that I, I, I'm not discrediting their, their work, but I'm like, I could do that. Uh -huh. He's this got 2.5 million. Yeah, he's got 2.5 million subscribers. Fuck. And this that temptation. I'm like, but I would hate myself. I would hate myself. Uh -huh. I would hate myself. I'd hate myself doing like sitting in front of a waterfall talking about like, uh, you know, um, uh, you know, microdosing mushrooms. on mushrooms and shit, like uh, just as an ad. Like I, I would like. You have like no throw, relationship with your audience. I would put the metaphysical uh, shotgun in my mouth and just like Hemingway myself. It would just be like I, can't, I can't, I can't do that. <laughs> Damn it. Um. So you're you're reading a transcript from it, and when you were reading it, I, I was kind of almost passively listening. Like this sounds like unqualified reservations. Mm -hmm. Like. The the tenor, the the peppering of both historical and current situations with a lightness to it. So you can almost if you want to dismiss it, you can dismiss it. 
But if you're paying attention, you really start paying attention. Mm -hmm. It's all signal. Mm -hmm. It's all signal and done in that sort of Straussian kind of method where it's like, hey, we're just talking. I'm eating your gummies. Hey, hey, wait, hey, man. Hey, cool. You know, and it was, I watched the video and it's like, he's, he's doing that hand thing, which is ah. like almost disqualifying for me. Like, uh -huh. This is creepy, by the way. Like, can you can you stop doing that? Because you're, you're creeping me out. Um, You've got to do is this, right? Right. Yeah. You get your... Get your Illuminati hands. Wyman is going to freak out. Right <laughs> right. You got to cover one eye. <laughs> just signaling, you, folks. <laughs> yeah. hey, man. I'm just saying we're for, we're for sale. sale. <laughs> yeah, right. it's, it's embarrassingly low price tag, actually. <laughs> yeah. <He's> shockingly low. <laughs> I would feel bad about it, but if I got the money, I'd be like, I feel fine about this. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <I'll do laughs> Nothing to feel bad about. <laughs> nope. Okay. Uh, anything else on the current state of Yarvin before we get into this? Um, the one other thing that that stood... Now, this is, this is purely speculation. This is me very much reading my own priors in, but it squared for me that... I think part of the reason why Yarvin was more, there was more energy and more, f more forcefulness behind what he was saying here. And he was actually starting to describe, he's not speaking in cultural abstractions and drawing patterns and stuff. He was actually starting to describe very specific detailed sorts of plans. And what this, the sense that I got is that he's being emboldened because he recognizes that this is not he. So here we are, got on the screen, Patrick, he wrote this November 13, 2008. So just over 15 years ago, 15 years ago, this was like, not even Crazy this is, this is, fan, this is sci-fi four years ago. This is still pretty much sci-fi. Even a year ago, it would have been kind of like, yeah, you know, it's kind of an inter interesting thing, whatever. But now all of a sudden happenings are happening. And it seemed to me that he was speaking from that, like, okay, now we need to start getting a little more pointed with this because we actually have a means of starting to generate this sort of energy and, and, and move in this particular direction. I mean, he explicitly gave dates. Like he said, by 2050, like this, like the, our time is running out to be able to do something like this, or by 2050, we're going to be South Africa. Right. And like, the, That's the, good framing. The, the the example he gave, where he's like, "Look, if the, if this liberal uh, liberalization of the border co continues, basically it'll become that everyone's an American, uh, mm -hmm. everyone deserves to be American." He goes, and so he's like, "That eight million crossing the border, that's that's trickle, that hits mm -hmm. Africa. Suddenly, you go from like eight million to fifty million to five hundred million in an instant, mm -hmm. um, and once that happens." Well, you no longer have a country. I mean, this is this. Right. Is, uh, we're, I don't want to get ahead of ahead of ourselves here, but because we'll probably tie this in somehow. But this is what we're talking about in terms of uh, uh, the civil frame versus the primal frame. And the one assumption you have to start the the one essential the, the one assumption that is critical for this whole thing is to uh, assume that you no longer have a civilization. Mm -hmm. you know? it, it 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 was. It, Putting it in the context, like a more uh, normal context, like you were dating this really nice girl, uh, you had this really nice relationship, you thought you were going to get married, yeah, you, you had all these future plans together, and then she broke, and then she dumped you, and she's not picking up your calls, and you got to stop calling, man. Like it's getting creepy now. Like she's <laughs> moved on. You got to move desperate. on to. Yeah, you sound yeah. really desperate, and it's and everyone around you is like we're. We try to console you a little bit, but we're getting to the point where, like, dude, our friendship's almost at a at a, at a critical junction because I can't keep talking, I can't keep hearing about her every time we hang out. Like, you know, uh -huh. you want to go play pool? No, no, I don't. No, because I know nope. it's gonna, what I don't. I know what that's code for. <laughs> so, yeah, it's pathetic. It's pathetic. I don't right. want to be around pathetic. I right. guess one other point I would make would be um, that one thing that really suddenly clicked for me in this that I I hadn't. I felt kind of slow after it clicked for me. I was like, how did this, how did I not see this before? I've seen a few different times. I was talking on the show the other day about how Vivek has 
two distinct communication modes. He has stump speech, campaigning, um, uh, barnstorming. Like he has that mode where he just goes into straight political rhetoric and he's preaching to the choir. Then he has a uh, podcast interview mode, long form podcast interview where he will discuss off the cuff at length in tremendous detail down to the minute details of the functionings of the financial sector, of of government policy, of the structure of the executive branch. Like this, this is this is not a guy who's just you know just just kind of uh, out here to run a media campaign. Like this, this guy is very intimately acquainted with 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 what's going on, and he's signaling hard on how how you go about this. And what clicked I mean- for me. Sorry, was he? One, yeah, just, just, just do one little thing. And even if he's just a spokesperson for a think tank, that's an amazing think tank. Yes, like, the best think tank ever. Amazing. Yes, top notch. Whatever, right? Like, it, even if you want to go go over the negative, it's still positive. Sorry, go ahead. Right, right, right. And what clicked for me this time is he said stuff a couple times. I've heard him even in his interviews. He said stuff like uh, the. Um, the Constitution is like the best governing document that's ever been created by man. This sort of thing, which get, that triggers my like boomer con cringe uh, uh, sensors. And then it clicked for me what Yarvin was saying here. I think Chuck Dirk actually didn't quite pick up on this. Yarvin was saying, no, we're not tearing up the Constitution. We're not. We're doing all of this constitutionally because this is the brilliance of the Constitution that it actually is... If you have clever enough people, it's actually almost infinitely malleable. And like we see this as a critique of the Constitution, but he's saying, no, 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 no. We can do all of this under the auspices of constitutional government. So it's purely just a matter of political will. It's sheer, just it's just political will. And then you can well, you can capitalize by saying you, you can capitalize on the patriotic American boomer, whatever sentiment by framing this as like, we're, we're saving America. If we don't do this, there's going to be no America. You're going to be invaded by 500 million sub-Saharan Africans. We're doing this to save America and we're doing it constitutionally. The, the, the power of that framing is, I think can't be underestimated. Yeah. Legitimacy is, is, is incredibly important for any regime. I think this is what the Biden uh, regime has completely lost. It's stunning to me to go through the WEF. Davos just met. We're recording this in January of 2024 for all you people in the future. Uh, And there's been, what now, five, six easy uh, speeches or commentary from people who are at Davos or connected to whatever, all coming out and saying, yeah, this is done. Uh... Trump is, we're throwing our, our, our weight behind Trump. He was right about immigration. He was right about NATO. He was right about, uh, um, whatever the else economy. Saying, the economy. That was dying. And, to load. Yeah. And there, I mean, it's being echoed by, uh, there was a, another guy, CEO of not Steven Black Schwartzman, Rock, but, the CEO of Blackstone. Yeah, and exactly. And Javier Malay and Boris uh, the, Johnson now. One of the one of the top guys at the Heritage Foundation just like mm-hmm. lit, went down scorched earth saying Trump's coming in here and your days are numbered essentially. Mm-hmm. Um which again I think if we think of Trump as almost a proxy as a skin suit you have all these what the thing that you didn't have in 2016 is this. Mm-hmm. A bunch of very upset, very powerful, rich and influential people who are like, look, We don't like how he talks. We don't like how he looks. We don't like this. We don't like that. But they're right. And we like having a country. I think the my intuition is this, and you see how you feel about this, and then we'll get into the reading. Some people are pointing towards uh, Israel and Palestine being the, 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 the inflection point for this change. I honestly think it's actually the defeat of NATO in Ukraine by mm. Russia. I think that that's now proven to them, and the fact that Russia has pivoted, and China has pivoted, and is now uh, embargo proof, or is now uh, sanction proof, uh, and they basically just did this to the entire mm-hmm. American regime. Curtis Yarvin once said, "I think it was in, uh, I think it was in unqualified, that 
the question really is are we at at the end of the american republic or are we at the end of the american empire mhm mm and the american republic is not a big deal as or as as a big deal that can be mm -hmm. reformatted redone whatever end of the american empire however now that's a different story mm -hmm. because all these big giant people with money influence and power have all relied on the idea that no matter what happens okay yeah mashugana trans yada 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 we'll let that burn out we'll, we'll do we'll, whatever right but ultimately on the world stage we have stability now you have massive instability on the world stage nato just got beat they're done like nato is now a paper tiger they, they, mm -hmm. they call china paper tiger and russia paper tiger for years nato is the paper tiger and it's undeniable to anyone with half a brain that has got to be unsettling mm -hmm. especially with money and interest who again you know when you're investing billions perhaps even trillions of dollars into worldwide trade you don't want instability like of that sort you don't want to maybe wake up to the to the day when like russia just has half of half of europe not through conquest but by ev everyone going we're going over here <laughs> like Hungary's like kills off like peace out, dude. Uh, we're, no, we're 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 dealing with business with Russians, Romania, Czechoslovakia. Like, there's like a whole bunch of countries that could easily just say, "We don't like this 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 agenda." Uh, Russia's now powerful. NATO's a paper tiger. So you, you're 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 not giving us anything. The only reason we're, we were we we got in bed with you is is pr from protection from Russia, and you can't protect us. In fact, you'll you'll sacrifice us. So maybe we should just go do business with a bear. Like it's catastrophic in terms of domino effects and global in, in global politics. And people kind of yeah. forgotten about Brexit, but Brexit really laid the foundation for a lot of this. And so there's already the 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 legal and political framework for for uh, countries to exit the EU. That like the EU is is. Um, I, I, so I, I think we're going to start seeing the EU being called into question before long. And Vivek, on that episode toward the end of it, he was counter signaling the UN, mm -hmm. talking about that that the time has probably come to reevaluate our stance with the UN. And I, you know, I think the UN has outlived its 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 usefulness or something like that. I was like, damn! Like again, seeing him as a mouthpiece for larger powers we're hearing what they think the two massive missteps that i i'm i'm still shocked I, and i shouldn't be shocked at this point the two massive missteps sorry that they've done over in europe and they're, and they're threatening to do in the united states was seizing russian assets to to fund ukraine so by doing that that's a signal to every other country in the world that your money's not safe mm-hmm your guarantees are no longer guaranteed. You do something that they don't like, or they or or you're you happen to have a, a conflict with with a group that they want to support and they're not going to support you, they're going to seize everything. Mm -hmm. So why would you do business with them? Like I, I they were threatening it, and then they actually started doing it. I think Latvia just uh, seized or Estonia just seized um it's called the Russian house. Uh there's a whole bunch of big big real estate. Um, that was a, basically a Russian uh, asset that just seized it, repurposed it. They're, they're promising the Ukraine. Uh, I think Biden is about to, is, is is threatening to seize something like I don't know five hundred million or or plus uh, assets to free up and sell to Ukraine. Like it's insanity. Like that's that move is pure and total insanity. Um, and then and then yeah, it's, it's just it, the catastrophic uh level of dominoes they're playing here is only possible when you're dealing with people who who think this 1965 uh who or who wanted to be 1965 perpetually who don't understand their opponent and don't want to and just think well we'll just steamroll them you know we're america you know we're the mm -hmm. biggest most powerful military in the world it's like staffed by who <laughs> <laughs> like you're you're in critical failure, man. <laughs> like this is this is bad. And as <laughs> as someone from who lives in the West, I don't want to see it. Like I'm not I'm not a big like we all say this it's going to collapse. And in some in some little Freud 
part of my brain i'm like yeah collapse then you're like oh collapse Ooh, oh my kids <laughs> oh, kids we better learn chinese real soon because i live in australia <laughs> so, like, <clears throat> so we'll see there's a big pivot happening mm -hmm. <laughs> and i think that's um it's why we do a little bit of mobile book mm -hmm. 15 years ago that's crazy what were you doing in 2008 uh, that would have been the, let's see, in September of that year was when I first started college. Right. So it was, I mean, like another lifetime completely. Yeah. 2008. I would have been in my mid, mid to late twenties. So I was working restaurants, getting drunk and high. <laughs> and having frivolous relationships thinking of nothing just like uh -huh. thinking i was in a i was in a 90s mindset for a really long time and like an embarrassing long long, long time like it's gonna be fine <laughs> <laughs> until it isn't okay right. so, uh, so uh matt's gonna do the honors of reading here because i got a bit of a cough and a toddler in the room uh so this way i don't have to uh pause reading to hack my withered lungs out i'll just start this off patchwork a political system for the 21st century chapter one a positive vision take it away matt i'm afraid unqualified reservations has been a bit well grim of late one can only flirt so long with confederate racist fascism before eliciting a few jitters is our reader really going to be dragged into this horrible subterranean universe is she even comfortable having it on her computer at work and then we took this awful bumpy ride into the eel-infested deeps of Obama derangement syndrome, which can't have helped matters. So in this installment, I thought it would be nice to be positive. Therefore, let me present Patchwork, the mensist vision of a political system for the 21st century. At the risk of being accused of a sales job, I will paint Patchwork in warm, glowing Obamatronic pastels, rather than our usual chilly Machiavellian cynicism. Yes, I know this is unfair, but here at Ur, we're always closing. To start the hype machine, let's just say if anyone can build anything like Patchwork, even a tiny, crude third world ripoff of Patchwork, it is all over for the democratic regimes. It'll be like East Germany. Right, let's pause there for a second. Up a little bit. That, I feel like this is something to really pay attention to. Um, mm -hmm. If anyone can build anything like Patchwork, even a tiny, crude third world ripoff of Patchwork, it's all over to, for democratic regimes. This ties into uh, exactly what we're th thinking of building. Something mm -hmm. that is probably going to be tiny, crude, and even third world, perhaps, in comparison. Mm -hmm. But it might work. So, go oh, sorry, mm -hmm. go ahead. It'll be like East Germany competing with West Germany. Funnily enough, the fun financial relationship between the U.S. and the Gulf slash East Asia, the most patchwork-like part of the world at present, is oddly reminiscent of that between the OECD and the Warsaw Pact. The latter borrow from the former to buy cheap consumer goods supplied by the former for the latter's serfs. Children growing up in the Patrick era will learn a new name and a new history of the democratic past. They will date the period to the Dutch invasion of England in 1688, which ended the span of legitimate continuity in English government that began with William the Conqueror, replacing it with eternal degenerate Whiggery and the quizzling constitutional or ceremonial Hanover princes. And they will surely call it something cool, like the Anglo-American interregnum. Insulting it with the name of democracy will be coarse and over the top. Said interregnum, which we are of course still in, has been a period of global monotonic decline in official authority. As in the late Roman period, declining official authority, declining personal morality, and increasing public bureaucracy are observed in synchrony. This is not in any way a coincidence. The combination is an infallible symptom of the great terminal disease of the polity leftism. Leftism is cancer. At least in its present adult sclerotic and non-fulminating form, it is extremely slow in its progress, but the end is not in doubt. Okay, On any thoughts? <clears throat> um, Sorry, I don't want to like, keep knocking you out, but... Yeah, no, no, you're good. I just, I, I just like the, 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 the sentence, leftism is cancer. And yes. um, and also the Anglo-American interregnum. That, that, that line just clangs around in my head all the time now. Yeah, interregnum essentially meaning like a, a middle period. Um, mm -hmm. 
a, a state between two places. I've actually started using it. I started I started seeing certain people as as these middle children. Like I would say, Charlie Kirk is a great example of a of a middle child. Maybe the whole millennial generation mm. is this middle this middle generation where uh, I think I think back to Fight Club kind of thing. Like you know, and he was really talking about Gen X, but this you know. Uh, this generation without without purpose this you know what are you doing who are you why are you like what are you doing other than to like go to work produce money to feed taxes and your landlord and buy some consumer goods and then do keep doing that until you die like that seems to be the new that unfortunately this is like the liberal the the liberal version of stability is 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 mediocrity mm-hmm. and and that just that's why it doesn't work <laughs> mm-hmm. it's it's also very sisyphean the right this idea it, it like it's kind of like we're gonna make everything so equal that and and we're gonna we're gonna try to make we're gonna try to uh instantiate every possible value in reality in a like strictly locked in way that it becomes just the the, the society becomes just intolerable and unbearable yeah and it's it's weird that they just don't see it that way like mm-hmm. they it's weird that you have this entire experiment called the soviet union and then you look at it and you look at the crappy architecture the soul crushing designs the the fact that by the time it collapsed in the 19 in the mid 80s really when it started collapsing in the mid 80s everyone just like the, the the common refrain was we pretend to work they pretend to pay us uh mm. everyone was checked out uh birth rate there's no crashed. art from it there's no like well in the later period anyways and all the mm-hmm. all the only art really was was hangovers from the from the czarist period mm-hmm. balishing dancers mm-hmm. uh you know even you'd say that some of the great soviet art was all propaganda right <laughs> so, or or it was people who were who were counter signaling the soviets like dostoevsky and right yeah uh or people who had le- who had fled and then could mm-hmm. write, uh, mm-hmm. even Alan Kandera, from uh, who was a Czech writer, but you know he did some of his best work, kind of critiquing uh, Soviet. Uh, the unbearable lightness being, I know it may, it may not be everyone's cup of tea, but there's one chapter in there that talks about uh, Soviet kitsch, or mm. uh, and the way he brings it out, I, I quite I use it quite often. Uh, his definition is kitsch is the denial of shit. So, <laughs> it, yeah. So you can see it in politicalism, where it's like, even now you you, you get the guys like who's the who's the guy um, just recently uh, David Pakman mm-hmm. at a call-in show, and this guy's talking to him and saying, you know, things on the ground are really bad, man. Like no one can afford uh, groceries. Like it's it's a choice between your your gas bill and 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 feeding your family and all that stuff. And David was just like, I look, I don't, I just. I don't respond to uh, little stories. I only look at I only look at numbers. I'm saying the GDP is up, unemployment is down. Um, uh, what was his What was his other one? I can't remember. There was some, some other stat, and he just kept repeating it. And the guy was like, "No, but you don't understand. Like it's really bad. Like it's like people are dying in the streets. Like it's like homelessness." And he's like, "Look, GDP is up. Uh, like I don't know what to tell you. If you can produce any other salient points to counteract these to counteract these numbers, I'm I'm all ears. But until then, so in in David's mind, like." I'm almost waiting for them to redefine housing so that it, mm. you can go to a shanty town, like where a piece of steel, a piece of uh, cardboard on on two on two sticks. Well, it's shelter. That's housing, my friend. That's a housing uh-huh. unit. Homelessness is down. <laughs> Look at all these people. <laughs> they all have housing. <laughs> like it's it, housing. You know, homelessness is gone. I don't know what you're talking about. What's what's the problem? Um, yeah, it's kitsch. It's political kitsch of looking at the whole thing and going, but GDP, GDP up, GDP up. I saw a tweet today where a guy was talking about GDP, and he said uh, if you had two two stay at home moms who hired each other to do their jobs, so the one mom went and worked to take care of the other family, and you know, vice versa, that net GDP would be up, but like y- you wouldn't. You, there's like no additional value has been generated because right. they're both they're both working as stay-at-home moms they're just working as stay-at-home moms for each other <laughs> right 
Yeah. And I said Dostoevsky, I meant Solzhenitsyn. Yeah, that's that's fine. Um, I mean, there's also um, yeah, there's a, there's a few. <clears throat> it's not that the Soviets didn't produce any art. Is that a civilization like that who's promoting themselves as this as this as the second world power? Uh, you know, from the '60s on up, you'd expect to see great works flying up their ass all the time. Mm -hmm. Other than the space program and some military programs, really was nothing. Like the cities look mm -hmm. all the crap. They they're, they're having to like redo all that stuff because it's it's awful looking. It's the same thing we're seeing post nine in night. I just just thinking about this this morning. You think of a, I think American civilization ended somewhere in the in the in the nineties, maybe ninety two, ninety three. By ninety five, it was officially over. The Cold War was over. Massive amounts of money was being pumped through the system. Uh, everyone had uh, you know a chicken in the oven and bread in the basket. Like it was it was if you if you weren't I, I was I was basically nearing adulthood at that time. So like it's it's a different thing. Like uh, you, 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 it's hard to describe the 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 spirit of like uh, hopefulness in the air at that time. Mm -hmm. You had all these people who were willing to invest, who wanted to invest, who wanted to do things. And what do we build? Nothing. What great cities were made? None. What great lasting pieces of art? What great heroic epics? Like, like anything that you would normally associate with a great civilization that would have used all that massive amount of capital to do something with? Where is it? Doesn't exist. Doesn't exist. That's stunning to me. That's like you had you you got the biggest victory. The whole entire West got the biggest giant victory, literally dropped in their fucking lap. The competitor's gone. Money for everybody. Yay. New markets, everything. What do we build? That probably signals just how much of the American identity that existed to that point was a dialectic relationship to the Soviets. So when the when the enemy, when the, when the foe collapsed, the thing that united us all against this, this enemy, they tried to substitute and it kind of, this sentiment sort of persisted into the early, early two thousands with, with, uh, radical Islamic terrorism and, and, you know, but, but it, it was already really, <clears throat> really starting to wane. And, and then there's like, nobody, nobody looks back to the two thousands with fondness except for the people who were like coming of age in in the 2000s where they have it's like associated with significant life events yeah you're you're 21 like, you're getting laid in college like yeah that, that right, was awesome right right kind and of so the then there's there's like a there's like a uh like the other day i tweeted something out or there was a um what was the song uh, uh move along by the all american rejects which is just like right. the most 2006 song of all time and to me i listened to that song and i'm like i, I don't listen to that and think, oh, this is like, you know, this, this song belongs on top charts, but I listen to it and sentimentally, it makes me really happy because it reminds me of memories and stuff from that time. But there is no, the nineties, even it was starting to struggle for these sort of like real cultural iconic, um, brands and genres and, and, and I mean, you've basically got like the Lord of the Rings series and then Harry Potter but those were, mm. I mean, those those aren't like like Lord of the Rings is. I, I would say Lord of the Rings is gen, It's probably the best best trilogy ever made. But but like by the end, I mean, we're still talking early two thousands. So by the time you get to the mid to late two thousands, everything is just by that point. There's a lot of political unrest. Obviously, the economy starts going into the shitter, and all of this is just lagging indicators of I think we, what you're pointing out that happened basically with the fall of communism and and the outworking of that. Yeah, it's amazing because because even the in in the eighties you had growth like you had mm -hmm. you had building now, you know whether we we think the art of the eighties and all that stuff is is long lasting. People still call back to it because that was I mm -hmm. think the last gasp of true Western ingenuity, competency, care, you know, mm -hmm. a desire to to present itself on the world stage as as a as a as a as a truly great nation. Um, I think Reagan really had a lot to do with that, you know, and mm -hmm. I'm no, I'm no, I'm, I am the, I'm the opposite of a Reagan fan, but mm -hmm. where the old man got it right occasionally, like 
I could kill for some Reagan energy right now in, mm-hmm. in, in anywhere in the West. Like just, and interestingly, Reagan was a vehicle for powerful moneyed interests in the same right. way that, that we're seeing happen with Trump. Yeah. Okay. Uh, let's continue. I'm just going to give you a little bit of ground here because I really need to uh, go to the services. I'll be right back. Okay. Yeah. On theoretical grounds alone, the feat has never really been achieved, at least never for good. The only cure for leftism is complete and permanent excision. Success implies complete absence of the organism from the body politic. This does not mean there are no leftists in the country. In a well-governed country, which is at peace, people can think or say whatever they damned well please. It just means that if there are, for some reason, leftists, their views are completely without influence on government policy. So people laugh at them and call them names. Isn't this a lovely vision? A Lenin-esque feat of delirious constructive imagination? A world without leftism. Imagine. It's hard to imagine only if you have trouble imagining a Nazi John Lennon. A feat which taxes my imagination not at all, but maybe I've been reading too much Hitler. It really is a tough call to say who was more coherent, Lennon or Hitler. This, this, These two paragraphs here, this is like, this is classic Moldbug. This is... I know some people don't like his his writing style. They they find him excessively wordy or something like that. But to me, his his just separating the 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 content of his writing from the structure, the style, the voice of his writing is his his voice is this is a performance art. When he's writing, he is engaging in a performance art. He's having fun with it. You kind of see the way his brain works, and he's very clever. He brings in lots of little clever illusions and. Um, I was just saying just before you came on back on Jason that that this, these two paragraphs here might be like like this is this is if you could distill Yarvin's writing style down that like this is it right here. Like success implies complete absence of the organism from the body politic. This does not mean there are no leftists in the country. In a well governed country which is at peace, people can think or say whatever they damned well please. It just means that if there are for some reason leftists, their views are completely without influence on government policy. So people laugh at them and call them names. It's just, I, I don't know anybody else who writes like him. And I, I just get a kick out of it every time I listen to it. Yeah. And, and it's, it, he's just kind of built on this and evolved through this. When he, we had him on the show, um, I can't remember how it was produced, like how it would, would produce it, but he basically just, we're, you know, going back and forth and letting Yarvin do his thing. And at one point he was like, look, he's, he was like, yeah, but I'm not, I'll never be content until we have a complete and total regime change throughout the West. Like, and he said it, you know, dead serious, like, like not to be confused. Like, no, no, no. Like we're not talking like half measures and <laughs> we'll just reform and revitalize that. No, 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 no. Where this is going to be a 100% complete, um, change in many ways he is uh i know Oren talked to you mentioned dugan i can send you some dugan stuff um or just watch our playlist where we read uh did a live reading of yeah um where we did a live read uh of dugan's great great awakening versus a great reset but yarvin is very much our our american dugan our western dugan mm. um it's <laughs> Of course, the Russians get this guy who's a PhD in Heidegger and uh, <laughs> written like 30 odd books and is, you know, based beyond all based, right? Daughter got uh-huh. killed, assassinated, like all this uh-huh. stuff. And we get Nebby Jew <laughs> <laughs> with a, the hairdo that looks like he should be an ex, he should be a, a, a roadie for Fog Hat in the 1970s. <laughs> but like, wait, wait. wait we get what we get. Yeah. You know, right, we get what right. we deserve. I'm not sure. But yeah. Okay, where did you where did you finish up? Uh Lenin or Hitler, the bottom of that paragraph there. Okay. Acceptance of this goal, which I will not attempt to justify yet, but which I think patchwork can achieve, is the difference between a conservative, i.e., a fellow who thinks he can beat melanoma with an emery board, and a full bore reactionary such as myself. If you happen to be wrong, you have leaped the rail of sanity. So it is incumbent on us to urge to argue carefully. But I'm sorry, I'm being intentionally abrasive again. As an extremist, I prefer this harsh confrontational rhetoric to any kind of honeyed cousining. The basic goal of Ur, which I don't mind admitting, 
is to convince people who are now progressives to abandon their delusions. Since progressives equate those who accept the reactionary narrative of recent history with acolytes of the great goat lord Abaddon, one must tread carefully. If you must come as an Abaddonite, the only way to set your quarry at ease is to constantly confess your vileness. That way the progressive might even just clasp you to his heart, along with all the satanic murderers he is so keen to embrace. Consider, for instance, the case of Jose Luis Dorantes. Masters, mighty masters, Lord Barack, Lady Michelle, and their new puppy too. Father who art in heaven, your lordships, how have we offended you? When did we sin? What penance must we say? Which word of yours did we cross to have a Jose Luis Dorantes inflicted on us? And how in grievous error may we repent? Another diversity training session, perhaps, or three? Again, just, he wrote this in 2008. It's interesting, right? Because I mean, he, in one of his earlier interviews, he, uh, or conversations, I should say, whatever, he alluded to someone he was talking to was sort of like pushing back on the Obama thing, Obama being a plant or being a representative of, a, of another power group. And Yarvin was bringing up the talking point that, you know, no, he's like, Obama was like um, basically a student for one of the weathermen group guys mm -hmm. who got into politics. And like, he's like, no, this is like, this, this is like hardcore communism. Like, yeah, don't get, don't get he drew a, dra a direct straight line from, um, uh, uh, John Brown, the the right. abolitionist terrorist guy to Obama. Right. The interesting thing is this, and this is I've been wondering about this as we as we watch all these uh, entities, let's say, uh, start to get behind Trump, and I kind of wonder if they had a so. One of the things you've been talking on King Pill, and one of the things we, we've been kind of discussing the King Pill Discord is this idea that. Um, that Biden might have actually been the secret pick of the PayPal mafia group, and basically to get someone in who can just, who could screw things up so poorly that they could Trojan horse their entire program in. That people get to the point where like, look, just just fix just fix the the really big broken stuff. Like, yeah, no problem. Hey, we just happen to have all these things all set, all locked and loaded. No What's problem. that? You we need us? To... Oh, I, yeah, we can sacrifice. We we can. Right. We'll step up to the plate. We'll take care of you guys. Now, here's the question. Did they get a, did, did they get to Obama and when? Hmm. Because, OK, here's my logic. Vivek is taking aim at the deep state, at what the Obama administration uh, allegedly called the I think they called the blob when they were trying to get Obamacare through they were kept meeting this sort of that middle management thing that Vivek talks about that Curtis has been talking about like the apparatus uh every these old tiny little fiefdoms that do not move that will never cede power over anything there is no there is no negotiation you you literally have to appease everyone at the same time across across board which is literally impossible so, and I'm going by what I've, what more or less the more or less official version of this was. Now, maybe that's all wrong, but we'll 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 make we'll go with this. Allegedly, Obama was and his team were incredibly frustrated with the blob trying to get through Obamacare, and you know, at one point, it was like, "Fuck it, right? Like, here's the thing. It's it's dumb. It's stupid, but." It, at least it fixes like maybe one thing, maybe a bit, which is the best we can do. So, and this is what maybe led to Joe Biden uh, whispering in his ear on the hot mic, like, this is a big fucking deal. It's like, you got something, you actually got something done. Yeah. In yeah. politics. <laughs> wow. <laughs> so I wonder if after that whole thing, Obama leaves and, and probably has some disgruntled thoughts what if maybe a peter thiel or a, a botha or who knows comes up to him probably not botha but <laughs> for reasons but <laughs> reasons, yeah. or elon musk but uh let's say peter thiel or an affiliate comes up to him and goes hey you know that whole thing you're like yeah that was that was really frustrating wasn't it yeah do you want to get rid of it do you want to like hurt them we can hurt them you want to want to want to help us Hmm. Yeah. Hmm. What do we have to do? 
get Joe Biden elected. Joe Biden? That schmuck? He's, he's screwing up. Yes. Yes. But he'll he'll screw yeah. everything up. Uh-huh. Uh huh. Yeah. Right. You, you get it? <laughs> uh. <laughs> <Any more. laughs> well, it's interesting because it always seemed like <laughs> like Biden was a uh like I don't know, Biden was like a stand in candidate to be hey here here's our guy, we're just gonna like put him up here and 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 have him fill a role for a little while until we get someone prepped to to roll in and and replace him with. You know, he's gonna, you know, all of a sudden have a turn for the worse and needs to go, you know. This Gavin Talk Newsom kid, this Gavin Newsom kid's right. got got money written all over him. Look at him; he's perfect. He's like he's like a younger Reagan. He, he's a, he's a Democratic Reagan. Oh, wait. right. Everyone everyone can see what's happening in California in real time now. Yeah, right. <laughs> and and then it just seemed like it just seemed like Biden just kept staying there and kept staying there and kept staying there and kept staying there. And then you had the thing where like everybody, all all the other candidates, all dropped out at once and all endorsed him, just just it, like in one move. And then it was like, okay, so they're actually doing, we're actually doing this, we're actually running the dementia patient. And what like what Yarvin pointed out to Charlie Kirk is that he said, I think this is a good thing because Americans need to see what their government actually is. And when you see this doddering old man whose wife has to help him off the stage. You see what America actually is, and that's what motivates people to want something different. One of the um, one of the light bulbs I put off on Matt's head when we were talking about um, Vivek, PayPal mafia, et cetera, and this whole angle was as I, I, I remember Curtis talking about right before the election, saying you know he's like he was endorsing Joe Biden, he was giving money to the campaign because he's like Trump is giving too much heat onto our people and making it harder for us to do things it's it's too much heat but with a joe biden it's perfect it'll be it'll be the carter administration again it'll be 1970 again 1970 whatever two three whatever it was it'll suck all the energy out the room and be left with a shambolic pathetic thing that you can't help but not want and <laughs> And he was saying this before the election, and and I wasn't putting it together. Like, oh, yeah. okay, whatever, or more like, oh, okay, base LARP, cool, right? Like, yeah, yeah right. You know, like, I got it, but I didn't get it. Get it? Uh -huh. And then now, at near the end of the four years, I'm like, I totally get this. This is yes, uh -huh. this is the this is the most brilliant thing you can possibly have done. Uh huh. And but it, it's like it's like it couldn't have just been done by Thiel, and it couldn't have just, obviously not just been done by Yarvin. I feel like everyone dropping out now. The story is that all the other political candidates, Pete Buttigieg and all the rest of them, who I don't think would have beat Trump anyways, fortified elections or not, yeah. maybe. But uh, he, but they all dropped out after allegedly. This is the story: a call from Obama, right? That the, the mm -hmm. everyone is speculating that Obama put a call in and said, "No, you're all going to drop out and put put your weight behind Joe." This is the popular story anyways so if we're going with that they had to get to obama now mm -hmm. whether they get to obama with uh the the promise of of screwing up the people who's who who screwed him up which i think is likely or they got to obama by doing some magic mind worm where it made him feel like he was the one coming up with this idea mm -hmm. results are the same right right and, and the thing to people the now this again, this here is, is is clearly speculation now based on kind of the pieces that we're putting together here. But just as story I, hour, folks, it's much more fun right, this way, though. Right, right. As I'm reading through, I'm doing this like six degrees of Peter Thiel thing, looking through all of this. I come across an article and I'm reading about it, and it's talking about the relationship between Peter Thiel and Mark Zuckerberg. Mark Zuckerberg was a sophomore, I think, at Harvard when Peter Thiel came to him and invested in Facebook. $500,000 investment in a sophomore in college in Facebook. That's a very significant professional relationship. You're always like, if somebody came to you, if you're, if you're 20 or something and some accomplished billionaire or he may not have been a billionaire at the time, but like some accomplished businessman comes to you, just, just was involved in PayPal, which is all the rage. PayPal just bought by eBay. You know, like we're, we're, uh, uh, uh in the tech world is taking off. This guy comes to you and he gives you $500,000 and invests in your, in your company. 
and but then they remained very close where Teal is basically like has been like a mentor to Zuckerberg since then. And this has been even in uh, when 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 Teal came out and publicly endorsed Trump and started speaking in, on his behalf and donating money to him and everything. The the Facebook board of directors had a conniption. Reed Hoffman, who's also the CEO of Netflix, lost his shit and was like, this is completely like un, like they, they were trying to force Teal out. And Zuckerberg was like, no, no, he, he went to bat for him. And I, like, I don't, I don't know how many of you guys have had any experience being around shit libs and the way shit libs lose their shit when they encounter a, a an apostate. But <clears throat> this is not like that's that, that would be some heat to be Mark Zuckerberg and to have these billionaires pissed off at you because your mentor is endorsing Trump. If you remember what 2016, 2017, like that whole era, what the tenor of the, like the environment was like, Mark Zuckerberg is taking major, major heat. This would have been like losing sleep over this sort of thing. Here's a difference for people who don't have, don't have, have maybe don't have this experience in a normal, with a normal human being, if they're, if they're upset with you, Though you might have an argument or, or a conversation and you're saying, no, I'm going to vouch for me to go, okay. And every time you bring the name up, there'll be an eye rise. Like, there'll be like, you can feel a friction, but it's not brought up again. With a shit lib, it's never ending. Mm -hmm. Every day, every moment, you got to, you got to post, here's a new email. There's no, and there's nothing you can say to stop this because there, there are results oriented people. They want the result, which is you throwing T Peter Thiel out. Anything short of that is is akin to murder, rape, uh, indigenous, uh, horrible indigenous affairs. I don't know, right? Like pick your thing. Right. right? And you're, so for for Zuckerberg, like baby. to to be running a, a, like one of the largest companies in the world and dealing with all the affairs of business and then all the affairs of politics and all of that, and then to be continuing to have Peter Thiel's back through all of that. That indicates to me that there's a very tight professional relationship there. And then there's one particular anecdote. I believe it was in 2019. Foggy, kind of foggy now. But uh, Peter Thiel all of a sudden came out with his hair on fire about China, which is very non-Peter Thiel-like, which automatically has me like, hmm, okay. So knowing Peter Thiel's methods, if he comes out with his hair on fire going after someone, that's because... He wants those people to think he has his hair on fire about them for a particular reason. And right at the same time, Zuckerberg started going nuclear on China, talking about them like stealing intellectual property. And he like testified before Congress again about them and everything, which was a departure. And, and Zuckerberg has, a, I believe, a Chinese wife. So this is again, it looks like the two guys are cooperating on something very significant. And, and watch this the, is the kicker then. The, sorry. Yeah, go ahead. The, so the kicker is the election fortification was the, the credit for that was given to $400 million from Mark Zuckerberg to set up all of the election fortification apparatus. I, I'm just, it's speculation, but I, those are, yeah, those why are would you, strong dots. if you cared about, Chinese uh, infiltration or or theft or intellectual theft, whatever. Why would you go with the can? Why would you toss out the candidate who was who's the only one man. who was attacking them and put in the guy who's the most compromised by 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 the CCP? Mm -hmm. It doesn't make sense, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. It doesn't make sense right. at all, right? But it does make sense if the idea is you need to see it. In memetics, so uh, Peter Thiel was a student of Girard. Uh, I learned this from reading uh, Luke Burgess' book *Wanting*. He went and interviewed. His the first it opens the first chapter. Him talking to to Peter Thiel because uh, they have the Girardian connection. So Peter Thiel understands memetics, I think, extremely well. High, he's a high level uh, practitioner of memetics. And with memetics, you have a, there's a few things that. Uh, that are operational uh essentially it's it's beyond psychology it's 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 something that people react to because it's ingrained in us children are are mimetic 
factories. Your child will copy you. And not just what how you do it, but why they're looking for why you do it. Wherever you give your attention, your child will be, will be, will be attracted to it. If you look at the cabinet a lot, because maybe that's where the cookies are, and you want your kid to get cookies, your kid will automatically go to that cabinet. Like they're watching you. They're they're because they because what you pre represent is a model of reality that they need to incorporate and figure out and 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 do as you do. Monkey see, monkey do. It's essentially this. So in in Girardian memetics, you have models and you have mediators or moderators. So a model is someone literally who people are trying to be like. And a moderator is someone who is directing people towards desires. And all in, in what's central to this is the is that desires, wants are always external to, to humans. We always want something that is out there uh, or that someone else has or that someone else is representing. We don't know to want the sports car until and it's not that sports cars can exist without one. It's like you, you, you create a sports car and then you create a desire for the sports car or there's a desire for the sports car. So you create it like either way, like chicken and egg kind of thing. But you need people directing you. This is where influencers come in. The influencer directs you to the desire. Something you didn't even know you wanted. In this case, Peter Thiel, uh, Mark Zuckerberg, and I think especially Curtis Jarvin are A-level mediators. Mm -hmm. They're showing, they're pointing you to the desire and telling you why it's desirable. Uh, uh, Gerard uses the example of Iago in, in, in Othello, who was just like, got Othello by the nose. He's the king, but uh, Iago just shows him and brings him to his ruin because that's what he wants. It's like, oh, Desdemonia. What, 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 what. Like, he's just like, he's, he's got him. Because he has the authority, he he you know the expert class, all this stuff. This is how people move, and they they and they if they don't know what to do, they just follow the person who says I know what to do, uh, and they're setting themselves up in that position of being able to tell people like no no no, this whole system is bad, but I got I got a good system for you, and people will buy into it hook line and sinker because the system that they have is so bad. <laughs> It's undefendable. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, anyway, obviously, I'm just trying to get you wound up, dear reader. I'm sorry. I know. It is crass. So let's have a look at patchwork. The basic idea of patchwork is that as the crappy governments we inherited from history are smashed, they should be replaced by a global spider web of tens, even hundreds of thousands of sovereign and independent many countries each governed by its own joint stock corporation without regard to the residents' opinions. If residents don't like their government, they can and should move. The design is all exit, no voice. I'm not aware of any specific writer that has proposed exactly this, but it is certainly not an original or interesting idea in and of itself. I've certainly read about six zillion science fiction books in which this is the general state of the future. The devil, however, is in the details. We will go into the details. The essential inspiration for patchwork is the observation that the periods in which human civilization has flowered are the periods in which it has been the most politically divided. Ancient Greece, medieval Italy, Europe until 1914, China in the spring and autumn period, and so on. Burkhart once observed that Europe was safe so long as she was not unified. And now that she is, we can see exactly what he meant. Small is good. Local is good. Different is good. We know these things. These are not controversial assertions, even in the hippest streets of Williamsburg. Heck, President Obama is probably a slow food man himself. Once, my daughter, aged four months, was in a bakery in the Castro and met Alice Waters. Alice Waters smiled and told her she was very cute, which she is. She might as well be on the Gerber bottle. And Alice Waters might as well be a duchess. Heck, Alice Waters probably laughs at duchesses. So how exactly did all these Obama maniacs, or... Oh, yeah, Obama, Obama, Obama maniacs, Obama maniacs, these whiter people, these Burning Man regulars, these young hip progressives convince themselves that when it comes to government, bigger is better. That, in fact, we need a world government toot sweet. 
that international public opinion is all that really matters in the world, that America should lead the world, feed the world, and be governed by the world. But somehow they did. The issues that matter to them, the composition of the atmosphere question and the like, always tend to be transnational, as big as possible. As Peter Gabriel put it, they think big thoughts. We reactionaries, when we act locally, would rather think locally as well. Always best to think about what you're actually doing. The paradox is just one more stimulus for a complete replacement. This paradox is just one more stimulus for a complete replacement of the state. We have had enough. We are done with the present system of government. We want a reboot. And anarchy being both impossible and unreactionary, we can't even talk about a reboot until we've specified what operating system to boot next. So we can think of patchwork as a new operating system for the world. Of course, it does not have to be installed across the entire world, although it is certainly designed to scale. But it is easier and much more prudent to start small. Innovations in sovereignty are dangerous. That's one of those lines. That's that's like a when you read Yarvin, like you get some of those banger lines. Innovations in sovereignty are dangerous. This is like that. That's the line that gets produced from a mind that sees the world really clearly. Yeah, when well, it's also respecting the respecting the enemy. You know, when I hear, I'm so done really, with anyone who wants to frame the current political situation, civilization situation as a fight. Uh, mm. I, I, I just dismiss them now as like, you're not a serious person. If you, because, <laughs> okay, so what, what, what's in your mind? Okay. Anyone trying to do anything, uh, trying to build money or capital or something like that and to, 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 to invest and develop. No, you're crazy. If you do that, they're going to they're going to come after you. They're going to destroy you. Don't do that. What we have to do is wake everyone up, and then when we wake everyone up, I guess what we we form militias. Like, what's the next big thing? Like, we're gonna we're gonna like do some weird French Revolution LARP. And that, so let me get this straight: us developing finances and and developing capital that will be a red flag. They'll destroy us, but. You developing a militia? Oh no, they'll they'll totally let that happen. <laughs> right. Yeah, you you running around knocking on all your neighbors' doors, yelling at them about the Illuminati. That definitely won't raise any red flags. That weird, definitely weird won't get you on any watch moment, list. Like, yeah. Whining yeah, right. running through the streets on a fucking horse. Like the British are coming. The British are coming. But you know, like what the Zionists are coming. Come raise your arms. Like okay. Jews are in the tunnels. <laughs> yeah, Jews are in the tunnels. Sappers everywhere. Uh like, what are we talking about here? Right. And he, okay. And okay. Let's follow the fantasy a bit. Even if you could do that, even if even if that was a, even a slight possibility, you could raise a five hundred thousand man army. Have you seen the state of people today? What great army are you raising? the 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 official army can't raise an army these days. <laughs> What mega, what giga chads are you pulling from the backwoods, <laughs> motherfucker? Like what? Like some two tooth hillbilly who's just like it's like six foot ten and just full of hatred? Like what? What are you doing? Like <laughs> where are these people? Like, Sasquatch? I don't know. Like it's just <laughs> what what kills me always. And when I came out with this sort of like a even very gentle forays into presenting the civ frame and civil frame and, and and that kind of blueprint is that automatically i keep hearing people say no you can't do that it's never going to work like okay uh why well because of all these other things okay okay so what what should we do oh well we we have to like eliminate we have to get rid of every illegal immigrant from the country like oh oh okay <laughs> oh we're starting so with, the small, telling... with the small tasks right right okay so your operational idea is to do this thing that is like insanity. Like I, I don't even know where you would start with it. Uh, you, I mean, it could maybe it could be done, but not by you. By the way, like, yeah, like what are take, you going to do? Like, You're just going to go like pick them up in your truck and drive them down to the border <laughs> and <laughs> say, "You don't come back anymore, Senor." Right. <laughs> <laughs> or, or do we do the thing that we've been that human beings have been doing for like a hundred thousand years? minimum uh which is like create civilizations like it's right. not like what i'm proposing has a historical record and a success rate what you're proposing is is silly and saturday morning cartoons and 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 the creation what we're proposing the creation of civilization is like 
a a platform for actually doing things like deporting illegal immigrants or sure. whatever other thing you want to do. Yeah, if you set it up right, you won't even have to deport the immigrants. Right. They won't be allowed in the first place. Right. You know, and the ones you already have will leave. <laughs> right. So so it's all good. Like you can have your thing. Like I was talking to this one person. Uh, sorry, we're going in tangents. I'm on my second whiskey, so the thing, things might get silly. Um, but we, I was talking to someone on X and kind of presenting this idea, and it, the pushback was like, "Oh, your billions around Christianity." Like, yeah, but you don't have to. You, you, you can theoretically uh, build this online with whatever religion your thing is. And I could tell there was like, "This is." I'm talking to someone who just wants to. They, they've got a monologue. They have a they have a novella saved up that they're just dying to get out. You know, you, you already get that feeling. You're like, <laughs> all right, brother, lay it out. Like, what do you, what do you really want to say here? And it's in, of course it reveals that the guys into Odin and stuff. I'm like, great. You go do that. Uh, mm -hmm. Go do human sacrifice, sacrifice, you know, the lame and the, and the old and the criminals and, and lean right into it, man. I, I don't know. Sure. You, you go do Odin's society civilization and see, and let's just see how that works out. I mean, historically, it means that I'm just going to have to conquer you, uh, right? And and build and, temples and on your on your uh, altars, right? <laughs> but you know, we'll give you we'll we'll give you a day of the week and call right. it quits, right? Yeah. Okay. Anything else you want to add to that, or you want to get no? Okay. A patchwork. Please feel free to drop the capital. Is any network consisting of a large number of small but independent states? To be precise, each state's real estate is its patch. The sovereign corporate owner, i.e. government, of the patch is its realm. At least initially, each realm only ho holds on one and only one patch. In practice, th this may change with time, but the realm patch structure is at least designed to be stable. Of course, Italy in the 14th century was anything but stable. Anything like a patchwork needs a strong security design to ensure that it does not repeat the constitutional solecisms of feudalism, nor will it be subject to the same pervasive violence or meet the same demise. In a worst case scenario, we could end up right back at liberal democracy. But don't worry, we will discuss this issue in considerable detail. To be a reactionary is not to say we must reinstall the exact political structure of the 14th century somehow, tomorrow, although that would certainly be an improvement on what we have now. To be a reactionary is to borrow freely across time as well as space, incorporating political designs and experience from wherever and whenever. As Nick Zabo has observed, the most interesting, detailed, and elegant European forms are found in the period we call feudal, and thus it is only natural that a reactionary design for future government will have a somewhat feudal feel. But patchwork is something new. It will not feel like the past. It will feel like the future. The past, that is, the democratic past, will feel increasingly gray, weird, and scary. This is how it would feel to you already if you didn't have a bag of demotic morphine dripping into each carotid. Don't worry, we'll try to get you out of the matrix before we turn off the anesthetic. In the future, the fact that once you would probably be attacked if you went into Central Park at night will seem preposterous. The idea that millions of random people who are not even authorized to be in the country were wandering around driving gigantic SUVs at triple digit speeds after 10 or 15 drinks and murdering random musicians on motorcycles will seem as weird as the idea that a pride of wild lions would march into Carne Carnegie Hall mid-symphony, close off all exits, and systematically slaughter the audience. Graffiti will be a matter for the museums, as will gangs, of course. The streets will have no cars, or very few. They will be safe. At night, they will be bright and full of lively, happy people. Wine will be cheap, restaurants will be unregulated, and fine Eskimo marijuana will be sold at Dean and DeLuca, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Well, so, the, I mean, obviously, he's describing a civilization that is is a little bit counter to what our ideal would be. Mm -hmm. But when he's reading this, like graffiti will be a matter for museums, as will gangs, of course. The streets will have no car or very few, very safe. This is this is exactly what I'm saying. This is a civilizationist frame. Mm -hmm. A civilizationist wants these things whether these things are even 100 percent possible or you know we can we can discuss or what you know what what we'd have to sacrifice to get these things but this is a desire that is only prevalent within a civilizationless frame mm -hmm. you do not have primalists do not see these things as benefits mm -hmm. they they would take them they would you know, enjoy them if they were there, if they were invited to the city and 
you know, fine Eskimo marijuana was, was sold, they, they, they would, you know, purchase some or be given some, that's fine, but they wouldn't know how to produce it and it would still be alien. Like, it's almost as if in a primal mindset, you need a certain amount of crime. You need a certain amount of cartel or a certain amount of chaos in order to feel at home. Because your entire mentality is, is adapted or maladapted to that kind of situation. It's like, it's like taking a high anxiety case and putting them in the middle of the woods. They'll go crazy. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like, you know, the, the, the quiet will drive them crazy. You know, mm -hmm. uh, it's an adaptive process. And it, it can mm -hmm. take, in this case, I think it can take generations, maybe thousands of years for people to finally have a tipping point of enough civilizations within a society, people who want to build, who people who are like, you know what I'm tired of? Mud. I don't like mud anymore. I, I actually kind of hate it. Um, we're walking in it all the time. Why? What could we do to fix this? Oh, streets? Yeah, that seems like a great idea. Uh, let's How do, do we get that. Out? Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> These kinds of descriptions apply to the kind of patch I would like to live in. They may or may not be intriguing or attractive to anyone else. You may prefer to live in a gritty urban patch, which is corrupt, dirty, dangerous, and generally difficult to live in. If there are enough people like you, there will be a market for this lifestyle. If not, not. I suspect, however, that you are outnumbered. And I imagine the new management of Manhattan would take the distance from Dinkins to Giuliani and multiply it by 10 or 20. There would surely be no such thing as a bad neighborhood, at least in the sense of an unsafe one. Oh, no. Absolutely impossible. Why hasn't this happened already? Why isn't Manhattan in 2008 half Disneyland, half Paris, half Imperial Sodom? Don't you think one or two people share these tastes? But the problem is that Manhattan is not governed in the interests of Manhattan. Capital, in short, is being squandered. In the patchwork, this is most unlikely to happen. Just put the a historic in that. Uh huh. Capital, capital in short, is being squandered. What capital? And mm -hmm. if you only think about this as material, you're missing the point. There is an immaterial capital being suggested here. A will, not just a will, but a vision. A collective vision, a collective desire for something to look, the, to, for something to represent you and your people in a way that you find satisfactory that that is is not just uh, a, a temporary like you know we we were talking um, in that members only stream about statues initially i'm like i don't know about, i don't know that i don't know that that's the greatest expenditure but like yeah you know what statues fine let's start there a totem something mm -hmm. that represents the people that says this is who you look like this is who you are this is, you know, if you're if ever in doubt, who am I? What's going on? Here, here you are. This guy. This is what you Lee, aspire uh, to. Right. Here's your great man. Here's your great figure, etc. Uh, symbol of hope. And and it it galvanizes the people around a central ideal, an idea, and you build and you constantly going. When in doubt, return to this. When in doubt, if things have gone wrong, it's the old idea of, of the um, of the of the um, uh, the, Jew, the Jews were given the Torah; they, they were given the um, the um, the covenant. You know, in, in the brick thing, constantly repeat it. It's like, you know, you don't want to lose this. If you lose this, you lose everything. Mm -hmm. It's not just a matter of of of. Uh, falling outside of God here and there, of making minor sin. It's like, no, no, if once you start one fractal error, the whole thing collapses and your whole kingdom is gone. I wrote to someone today that, um, that tradition is something that you could think of almost as something like social memory. It's the, uh, your traditions are the things that remind you of what reality is from generation to generation. It's a way that socially we remember things. And those the the traditions are the things that provide our identity to us. When you don't know what your identity is, you refer back to the tradition. You refer back to the rituals that you participate in together. That and that is where you derive your identity as a as a as a as a member of a family, whether that family is on the micro scale or the macro scale. <clears throat> yeah, the ritual and reality are one. 
Mm-hmm. That which ritualizes produces reality. That reality demands the ritual to to, re-est- uh, to reestablish itself and, re- and and continue itself across time. It's you can you can you can think of rituals, families, rituals, religions, civilizations as literally time travel devices. They're vessels. Mm-hmm. We place there's if you've ever been to some place like Paris, and I lived there for a few years, so I can speak personally of it. There's a moment. If you've been there for a bit, you realize that you're walking the same streets that some people, someone like you or whatever, has walked 500 years before. Mm-hmm. And in a in a stable, hopeful society, will there'll be people 500 years from now walking the same street. And that sense of permanence, you know, bridging a gap over, over let's say, 1,500 years is profound. It gives you a sense of being that is substantiated with things like religion and tradition and all these other things, all those things come into play. But it's essentially the, the gravity that keeps you to the ground. That that why do we do these things? Why do you apply yourself? Why work? You know, what's the line from uh, from um, uh, Heart of Darkness? is like, no, uh, no one likes to work. Uh, I don't like to work. No man does. But I, like to, uh, by, by, by I enjoy finding there's qualities within work that, that reveal themselves to me. Like I, there's, there are things within work that substantiate me as a, as a, as a I mean, me, I'll find the exact quote. So I'm going to read it out to you. It's a good one, but it's, it's, it's such in that sense of being like, I'm a being in time. I am connected to all my history and all my future is represented in me in this moment. I have gravitas, even me, humble farmer, me, humble man of no great resources can be, an operator can be someone who's 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 enriching this entire system. Like, when seen through that lens, why else? Why why wouldn't you do it? Be a street mm-hmm. cleaner. Like you know, you're maintaining. You're maintaining this great road. That's a great job. Like that's a that's a worthy job. You know, anyway. there's nobility to it, right? Because there's, no, there's nobility in your culture. Mm-hmm. You're you're you're. You're getting that rub that makes that makes even your lower your your lower status bearable because this, your the status of your civilization is so is so great that you know you're not just a sweep you're you're a sweep cleaner for the for the for the empire mm-hmm. the great for the French for the, the great French civilization you know not that shitty Belgium guys They're like no those 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 sweep clears are oh those they have it rough you know. We 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 at least have this great architecture, you know. I have wonderful wine. Like I, I, I get uh, two weeks off every year to go to you know to go to Provence and 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 frolic in the fields, whatever, right? Like, and the Belgian guys thinks the same thing about you, but that's how that's how it goes. Well, Belgians mm-hmm. are stupid. Anyway, but anyways, so, sorry. <laughs> the historical and political reasons why democratic governments are such a mess are complex. I won't go into them today. But perhaps for a little intuitive perspective, let's introduce ourselves to Herbert Crowley's Promise of American Life. Crowley was one of the founders of 20th century progressivism and of the New Republic in specific, a magazine never out of favor in the corridors of Washington. Observe the extent to which Crowley's optimism, optimistic, energetic vision of positive change has decayed into the superficially happy, but contentless and enervating hippie Starbucks Unitarian mien of his 21st century successors at the same office. I have linked directly to Crowley's conclusion, which is all you really need to read anyway. Here is a typical breathless passage. Do we lack culture? We will make it hum by founding a new new university in Chicago. Is American art neglected and impoverished? We will enrich it by organizing art departments in our colleges and popularize it by lectures with lantern slides and associations for the study of its history. Is New York City ugly? Perhaps, but if we could only get the authorities to appropriate a few hundred millions for its beautification, we could make it look like a combination of Athens, Florence, and Paris. Is it desirable for the American citizen to be something of a hero? I will encourage heroes by establishing a fund whereby they shall be rewarded in cash. War is hell, is it? I will work for the abolition of hell by calling a convention and passing a resolution denouncing its iniquities. I will build at the Hague a palace of peace, which shall be a standing rebuke to the warlords of Europe. Here, in America, some of us have more money than we need and more goodwill. We will spend the money in order to establish the reign of the good, the beautiful, and the true. 
civilization capital just spelt out mm -hmm. let's go through it do we lack culture we will make it hum by founding a new university in chicago right you need culture mm -hmm. capital you produce a, a factory of 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 in, in this case they he thinks the a university in chicago is a is a is a culture uh, capital um, uh, machine american art neglected and impoverished will enrich by organizing art departments in our colleges and popularized by, by lectures with lantern slides and associations to the study of its history. Like, there you go, right? Mechanisms within mechanisms. Factories. Mm -hmm. Like, capital increasing. Pre so it's like, here's the question. Why does a new university in Chicago equal culture? Now, it, it seems like it's like, well, it's a bit obvious. You know, doesn't need to be need, doesn't need to be said, but I think it does need to be said. Like, why does a university create culture? And what is culture? Like, what is this thing? Like, why do you need it? Why is it desirable? And in my framework, it's it's because it creates capital. Culture creates social capital that can be spent or invested. And if you have enough of it, and you're investing in the right places your civilization grows and expands. If you don't have enough of it or you or you or you in, invest poorly, your your civilization has to shrink. And eventually it'll shrink to the point where it's no longer a civilization, either it enters a hybrid mode or shrinks back down to the tribe. Mm -hmm. So it's expansion and contraction. And I think a little bit it's like almost like an accordion. I think you need a little bit of both constantly. And maybe the, the new thing we build is a system that can expand and contract without having to lose total ground. But it's, it, it's, it's understanding that all these things are not just culture for culture's sake is, is, a, is a misadventure. Culture for civilization's sake, however, is the right, right, rightful purpose of this thing. Why do you need, why, okay, you generate this money, why? What's it doing? What's its purpose? How are you applying it? Well, to make more money, okay. But can you maybe make that into making money beautiful? Mm. Making money hopeful? Can you transform the financial, uh, by inserting a heroic epic from the cultural side, to uh, so the social domain into the uh, economic domain? Can you make making money feel like it's a majestic, heroic effort? Instead of having the Wolf of Wall Street and Brian Gecko as your examples, mm -hmm. in French we'll say "tu comprends," you understand. <laughs> you see now, the problem the problem facing civilization is we have no heroes, we have nothing to look mm -hmm. forward to, we have nothing to build. What, what you see in modern, modern architecture, the problem with McDonald's isn't just, isn't just McDonald's; is their buildings are ugly. Who wants to go? You go there because you go there. But even that's decreasing. Like, well, why would I go there? If I can order online and not have to see that ugly building and be in that impersonal space where I just, I, where I order my, my order on a big giant pad, <laughs> where some minions in the back make my order and they pops out. It's, it's weird. It's a very strange experience. Why would you do that? <laughs> right. Mm -hmm. it's, it's decreasing your civilizational capital. Mm -hmm. By focusing on hyper rationalism, hyper being so effective that you actually have, have 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 made yourself so effective that you're you've you've destroyed your civilization where no one actually mm -hmm. wants to be effective anymore. Does it's make like sense? you've made yeah you've made things so efficient that they've lost effectiveness. Right, <clears throat> they've lost their beauty. They lost their truth. Mm -hmm. It's just like here. Je ne sais quoi. Yeah, who knows. Huh? We, we we live in Paris now, my friend. That's a Paris state of mind. Huh? Get to get crazy. Watch me make this baby smoke a cigarette. Huh? It's crazy. I'm a French. Who knows? Everything. Life is shit, but wonderful at the same time. Eh, come on. You know, I just saw your post. So there's what's this post going around? For some reason, people are solidifying around this 2001 song, this version, a rock version of. Uh, 
of the Michael Jackson song, um, was it? Smooth uh, Criminal. Smooth, smooth Criminal. You uh, put this up here. This is going on Substack, so I don't know how how uh, how this works. But Smooth Criminal's been going around as like this as this vestige, like this is what we lost. This was taken from you. You uh, you countered with uh, I see your two thousand one cringe and raise your Aquino. Oh, is that even is that playing? I didn't hear the audio. No. Hang on. You said, uh, I see your 2020 Razio Aquino, a song I, I deeply approve of. Um, I'm going to add something here. This is a song that uh, came to mind. <clears throat> I told Mark that one uh my co-host uh and uh best friend and and business partner uh because we're businessmen businessmen this is when we when we make it i'm buying the rights of this song and (laughs) and, and i'm going to start playing it in very inappropriate places constantly because this is this is the civil anthem Stop the rub. Stop the rub. Stop the rub. Stop the rub. Can't stop the rub. Can't stop the rub. Stop the rub. Stop the rub. Stop the rub. Can't 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 stop. Okay. Again, I don't know how this works in Substack. That just might have gotten this band, but um, <laughs> yeah, this is uh, we're building towards this, folks. If you want great rock anthems to return, join us. Mm-hmm. We, have, we are from the internet, and we are here to help you. <laughs> uh huh. <laughs> Make us big. Make us a oh, thing, so I can go. I know, right? Got you, got you, got a little yeah. sticky on that one, didn't you? Right, right. Because you hear it and you're like, "Fuck yeah!" Can't you can't mm-hmm. stop the rock? How could you stop the rock? You can't stop that. No. All right. uh, where were we? Do you want to do the? Uh, do you want to reread from? Uh, we will spend the money. By the way, fantastic reading. By the way, Matt. Uh, I, Thank you. Uh, I, I knew this was a good decision. Uh, <laughs> being my uh, my little. Half French Canadian stutter stammer. <laughs> Comprez-vous le l'anglais de la langue de anglais, Carlis Tabanek? Um, so start with we will spend the money in order to establish the reign of the good, the beautiful. All right. So this is finishing the quote from the guy that Yarvin is quoting. He says, We will spend the money in order to establish the reign of the good, the true, or the good, the beautiful, and the true. Back to Yarvin. Athens, Florence, and Paris. Imagine a progressive today saying he wanted to turn anything, let alone New York of all gods, Aegean stables, into Athens, Florence, and Paris. Imagine telling Herbert Crowley that in 2008, progressivism had triumphed beyond his wildest dreams, that the -the stick-in-the-mud isolationists of the Midwest were forever defeated and heard of no more, that Tammany was a schoolbook memory, that all agencies of government now operate under the close supervision of the universities and the press. Again, he's describing this 15 years ago. Like, I, I don't think it, it's tough to appreciate just how prescient he was, how clued in he was to pick up on all this stuff 15 years ago. And then imagine trying to explain that despite all this, New, New York City looks more like a combination of Paris, East Berlin, and Port-au-Prince, and Bingo. is in many places extremely dangerous at night. What on earth would the good man tell you? What would he even begin to say? I don't know, but I'd sure as heck like to find out the good, the beautiful, and the true. 
The patch oh, and patchwork. Just, just to dig down on this, the good, the beautiful, and the true, the political, the economic, the social, mm. right? Like these, mm. all of these things have to be present in order mm -hmm. for the thing to function. You can't just have the good without the beautiful and without the true. All three things mm -hmm. must be functioning at the same time to do what? To build capital. Mm -hmm. And when and you have the thing that is good, it will be beautiful and true. When you right. have the thing that's beautiful, it will be good and true. When you have the thing that's true, it will be good and beautiful. Right. They, sub they, sub they, they reinforce themselves. The ritual and the reality are one. This is the great grand paradox of civilization. That when it's being maintained properly and being invested properly and, and, and envisioned properly, it automates itself. It automates itself not through AI or to, just through te simple technology, which we can get into, but it automates itself by the, by, the, by the technology of human beings. Yes, it automates itself through humanity. Right. And because every single human being suddenly sees themselves as a representation of that civilization. So the health and welfare and prosperity of that civilization is the health and welfare and prosperity of that individual, of that human being, mm -hmm. of that person. So when we attach nominalism and liberalism into the system, this is where the rot becomes. Because reducing everyone to the individual, well, now not only do you have the weight of the universe on your shoulder, you are the only unit. You're the only unit of time. You're the only unit of capital. And you can't produce enough. It's impossible. Mm -hmm. Because you're flawed and you're weak and you're emptuous and you screw up here and there and everywhere. So by reducing it to the individual, liberalism, like I said, is the civilizational killer. Mm -hmm. What I, I'm, I'm very hopeful of the near future. I think the things we're seeing from Vivek and from the PayPal mafia and from uh, Yarvin, all the rest of it, gives me incredible amounts of hope for the next 20, 30 years or whatever, whatever it is. But unless they actually address the, the, the true culprit in this, we will be back to this problem in 60, 70 years. My grandchildren will inherit these problems. This is why I believe that no matter what happens in this election cycle, and great celebrations might occur, uh, WF is disbanded, our enemies are in chains, uh, Trump reigns, and, and a new American century flourishes, and the West is reborn and revitalized, and great works are being accomplished, and yada, 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 yada. But unless we address the actual rot, the lack of religion, the lack of unity, the lack of, of actual civilizational capital being produced, all we will get is this, this wonderful surge that once spent will, will, will leave us with nothing again. Mm -hmm. And my grandkids, who I have to think about, I mean, my, my daughter's three and a half years old, so it's weird to think about your grandkids at this point. <laughs> but, but, you know, hypothetically, or the mm -hmm. humanity's grandchildren, my, 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 the, the grandchildren of humanity, from my, from my perspective, I got to think about them too. And this returns us back to the civilizational startup project that no matter how good things get, unless we start to solve the capital issue, then it doesn't matter. We'll just, we'll come right back to this again. There's, there's no limiting principle inherent in, liber in liberalism. And in fact, liberalism itself is designed, is almost designed to destroy civilization. Limiting principles. Score. Right. Hmm. By reducing to the one, by, by being Gnostic to its core, by reducing it to this e eternal one, it destroys the family. It's mm -hmm. anti-Trinitarian. And what I'm saying is that civilization, it, it, it perhaps the reincarnation, and, I, and I'm, I'm going to be very careful here, but perhaps the reincarnation, the, the entire Jesus event, was to provide us with the Trinity and to provide us with a very clear understanding of how to build into the city of God. Not in your lifetime, not in our lifetime, but to continue this, this, this evolutionary event, 
in, in human psychology and human and in, in human civilization that will lead us eventually to the city of God. Mm -hmm. And one of the things I said, and I'll, I'll just say this and we'll go back to the reading uh, or you, you can please comment with, as you will, um, is that one of the things that was an aha moment to me is that as we automate this civilizational process and gives us more time, if technology's major capital is time and time is a, is now become almost infinite, uh, Every bit of technology in your house saves you literally days. And if you would go back to the analog, you know, the washing machine saves you, saves you or your wife or whoever was going to do it, literally a day, maybe maybe more, of washing it in the stream or you know some some more uh, analogical uh, kind of device. Everything you do is giving you all this time. You have this infinite amount of time, essentially. Uh, what I'm planning on asking people is not to give me your money, is to give me your time. Give me your giving your time is is a much more precious resource that I can use to build capital in in this project. But if we have if we get to this point where we have enough of our people with all this time, and I'm talking to my grandkids, my great grandkids, I, I'm talking far afield. Let's say we get to a a plateau of stable a stability. Well, what do we do with all this? What is our major investment? Our investment is back into people. So they, they can become saints. Mm -hmm. I'm not trying to get around the end times. I'm not trying to avoid it. I'm saying is that if we're given moments in time to do something, the greatest thing we could do as Christians is to produce more saints, to pray with us. Mm -hmm. so when the end times come, we will have an army of God. We will be part of the God project. Hmm. Civilization is a startup. God is a startup. And I know this might be heretical in some ways. I, I'm being careful, but this is this is the thing. Why do we do it? God, mm -hmm. Kingdom of Heaven, the the ultimate end of all the ends. And for the secularists listening who are rejecting this this idea. Fine, put it, put your ideal. Uh, we're living on Mars. We're we're in the universe. What? Sure, okay. That that thing. What I would challenge Elon Musk if he would hear this is like, before you build a civilization on Mars, why don't you build one here? Mm. Show us the way here, mm -hmm. and I will give you the blueprint to do it. The 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 framework, the grind set to do it. In a, in a modern language that is is transmissible to all your high-minded Silicon Valley nerds. Great. Civilization is a startup. Think of that way. Here's your white paper. Go. Build. Show us. And if it's so great, great. Export to the stars. If space isn't making gay, but whatever. So, <laughs> in in the Orthodox Church, we... we in the Orthodox Church, we uh, we have a phrase that that uh, you know, I, I learned very early on when I started attending it. It sort of it functions uh, socially, sort of akin to the way Jewish people say Mazel Tov. It kind of is is sort of used in the same way. But they say many years, <clears throat> and I didn't know exactly what that meant. It was just kind of like oh, many years of life, you know. So like when when it's someone's birthday, you say many years. If uh, someone is born, many years. Um, and I learned recently that what we're actually saying is we are asking God, it's a prayer, a brief two-word prayer. We're asking God to give them many years to repent, which ties in directly to what you're saying. And then a thing about liberalism, that um, so li liberalism is kind of like a social acid. It's like an, an acid that dissolves the ties that bind a society together. And one of the ways that it does this is because it destroys identity. And I mean this on the fundamental individual level, because if there's just you, if there's just a human individual, this, this abstract conception of a human individual, then there is no you. The premise, like you, assumes me. You can't have a you or a me if there's just a one single individual. So the, the premise, the fundamental like ontological premise of individualism destroys identity. It destroys personhood at its very root fundamental level. 
And it turns out if you have you and me, then we also have us, which is itself a unit. And there you have a little trinity, you, me, and us together. The us becomes a, 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 uh, uh, I want to use the, the something with corp, like a, like a corpus. It becomes mm-hmm. a body. The one single person. We, we see this even in our language. We say things like the, the, um, the spirit in the room or um, the spirit of the age or mob mentality. We recognize that groups of people have a consciousness. Groups of people have souls. There is a soul to a group of people in the a same body. way there's a soul to, to you. Even you are not a single thing. You are a sophisticated network of little individual lives that combine to form you. So even you, this one single you is also many. This is, and this is Christian anthropology solves the problem of the one and the many, the proper, What's, proper understanding. To bring it to even psychological terms, the, the distance between, year zero and year four depending on how you're calculating this in your life and you can see this if you're your father and or a parent and you're paying attention this is pre-memory you you Mm -hmm. can't most people can't recall anything before four years old five something like that and even then it gets very vague maybe you know your first bike or it's an association of things, or you get these kind of hazy memories of, of, of you as a child, and they kind of all get thrown into like, you know, age four, five, six, seven, you know, um, depending on the person. But so that zero to four is kept from you. But in that zero to four range, you are the most hyper mimetic creature on the face of this planet. <laughs> you are. Mm-hmm. And anyone who has a toddler can see it. Mm-hmm. All your good things and all your bad things are reflected to your through your kid. You know? <laughs> yes. And you notice it more because when they pick up something that you that is that isn't you, it kind of you're like, where'd they get that from? Mm-hmm. Where'd they get that saying from? You know, probably some kid at school or you know, bluey or some whatever. But and if you aren't cued into what they're watching, then 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 it strikes you as weird, right? Mm-hmm. Because they're so because we are so hyper mimetic, this idea that you at age 25, 30, whatever, have can can concoct you, the person, the individual, can create you out of thin air that you aren't tied to your parents or your culture, your family, your whatever your upbringing was, is not just wrong, it's insanity. <laughs> it's ludicrous. Yeah. It's blah, 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 blah. It, <laughs> what are you talking about? <laughs> As you get older, a lot of people struggle with the idea that you're becoming your parents. Like, yes, because mm-hmm. you always were. You're, you're not becoming your parents. You always were your parents. You just go through this period. And it's, I think, it's exemplified in liberal democracy in, in 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 our current system, where you're at odds with it, you're in conflict with it, and as you get older, you get tired, and you and you just you have less conflict with things, and you and you end up being your dad, or your version <laughs> of your dad, or your the the the, the your the, the teacher that you thought was a th- you know like you, that you that you modeled quite quite a bit, whoever, right? You show me you show me a human being in their in their in their thirties or forties, I. And if I could comb through your life, I could find your model Mm -hmm. and go, oh, you're just doing that. You wanted to be this dude. You structure your entire life around it. Mm -hmm. Oops. (laughs) So it's not a, it's, it's, you're, so, but here's the bitter white pill on this. It get it's, and this is one thing I, I, when I, when I converted to orthodoxy, I didn't understand it from an atheist point of view. Why it's so crushing? Why you get this massive nihilism? And here's my daughter, just being my daughter. I don't know where she gets it from. I don't know where she gets it from. It's her mother. Um, she, uh, you, you have all. What you don't realize is you have the whole weight of creation on your shoulders in atheist. It's all on you. All of it. All of morality. Everything you've put on your shoulders. 
when you when you one of the greatest things that I realized early on in, in my conversion to orthodoxy was that oh, this isn't on me. In fact, I'm to shoulder a small bit of this. My responsibility is only to take what God gives me. And as I increase, I will be given more, both blessings and responsibilities, which can be mm -hmm. felt as a suffering at times. Mm -hmm. But it's really, it's not a test. It's simply a proof. Mm. You, you know, when Abraham is, is asked to sacrifice Isaac, and this is a constant atheist, anti-theist example. How would a God who loves a man, who loves his people, demand such a thing? We don't get into the whole, like he didn't actually, he stopped him from doing it thing. But, but okay, what is, a, what is Isaac in this, in this example? Isaac was a gift from God. Abraham prayed for God for, for his son. Was given one son from, a, from an illegitimate mother that wasn't working out. Finally, got got his son from his from his wife. It was everything he wanted, everything he thought he wanted, was given this boon, and God said to him, "I want you to sacrifice this boon, the one thing, the one thing you've asked from me, and you've got, and you've been given by by a miracle, by grace. You must sacrifice this now, and be willing to do it in order to get anything else. That's the cornerstone of that story." And why it takes the responsibility off you is that all that's required of you is faith. Hmm. Faith that, that God will not actually make you kill your son. Mm -hmm. So you can carry out the com command with the faith that, but my God is good. Hmm. My God, you know, my morality is suspended. It's not on me. It's on my faith. And again, this is a story, so it's it's supposed to set an ideal circumstance, and you can extrapolate it and, and symbol, symbolize it any way you want, but it takes the weight of the cross off you to a certain extent hmm. by, by extending it across time and across all, all, across all people. It's not on you. Like, you bear it. You bear your... You, you bear your portion of it but it's not all on you and and i think for me i, I can speak personally once i realized that man what it was like then you're saying in, in a cathedral mm -hmm. your heart becomes a cathedral because you have all this air up there and as an atheist or as a as hyper materialist it's all on you it's atlas carrying the world on your shoulders because because it's because once you're gone it's gone like as far as you know as soon as you stop existing so does the world have you heard the the story go ahead have you heard the story of the um the monk with the cross that he had to bear and he wanted a new cross. Have you heard this, this story? No. So there's this, I don't remember the exact details of it. I'll, I'll butcher it a little bit, I'm sure, but. Talk through it. Um, okay. So there's this, uh, this monk who uh, has this, has this, his cross that he has to bear. And um, the way I remember the story being told is it's essentially, it's kind of like the, the cross that you're, you're, you have your baptismal cross. He has this cross that he's bearing and it's driving him crazy. He is just, he's suffering. He's very upset. He can't stand all of this uh, turmoil and everything that he's going through. And um, he finally, he, he tells his, I'm trying to remember the details of the story as best as I can. I think he, he like tells his guardian angel, like I, this is, I, I I'm fed up. I'm tired of this. I, why have I been given this cross? Why, why have I been, been, saddled with all of this pain and difficulty and struggle. Like every single day I get up and I carry this cross, I'm doing what I've been told and just not experiencing any benefits. Like what's the point of all of this? And, and there, and the, uh, the angel's like, well, we will, we'll get you a different cross. You know, we've got a whole room full of crosses over here. Come into the room where all the crosses are and pick out your cross, pick out whichever one you want. And so he walks in there and he, he steps into this room and he just looks up and it's just, 
up like infinitely in every direction all over just crosses, huge crosses, gigantic, uh, uh, like gigantic, massive crosses and little tiny crosses and in between size crosses and, um, you know, crosses of all different colors and all different, uh, styles and made out of all different kinds of materials. And he's looking at all of them and he's just like, wow, there's so many crosses. And then way off back in a corner, there's this little little, bitty tiny, little bitty tiny cross. And he says, that's the one I want. And the angel says, sorry, you can't have that one. And he's like, what? I like, you just told me that I could pick any cross. I'm tired of this cross that I've been bearing. I've been suffering through this. I told you I'm fed up. I can't keep doing this. And you told me that I could pick a new cross. You brought me into this room and you told me I could pick any cross that I saw. And I could take that one with me. And the angel said, well, yeah, you can. But that's the cross that you brought into the room. You can't take that one. You could take a different one. Um, that that reminded me of that. That story reminds me of the story you're telling here, Jason, the, 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 the picture you're painting here where you don't have to carry the cross. You just have to carry your own cross. I got to wrap this up and go be dad soon. Where are we at? Uh, are we close to the end? No, not even close. No, not even close. So let's put a pin in it. Mm -hmm. We can pick back up. Where are we, where are we at? We were at let's, the patch and the patch and patchwork that is Manhattan, however. Right. At the top okay. of the screen. The patch and pat patchwork that is Manhattan. Okay, let's put a pin in this. Thank you, Matt. Mm -hmm. um, sorry, I got to go be. Yeah, yeah, no, you're good. It's, it's almost midnight here, so I'll just go to bed. Yeah, yeah. Good. Uh, tell the people where to get you, where to find you. Uh, Kingpilled on YouTube. Kingpilled on any of the podcatchers. Uh, I think we've got everything up and running with those working well again. Uh, Real Kingpilled on Twitter, on Instagram, I believe on TikTok as well. I've put some stuff up there. Um, and uh, and then if you want to join the the Kingpilled supporting listeners group on Discord, where uh, we, I got to stop calling it the supporting listeners group because it's far more than that. It's become a, a legitimate, um, it's one of the best communities I've ever been a part of. I have the best conversations and we're really starting to pick up some steam here on, um, developing some specific, uh, projects to, for everybody to work on that are projects geared toward building and developing and sustaining civilizational capital. So if you'd like to join, um, come be a part of that with us at subscribestar.com slash kingpilled. And just uh, as a as a note, I think what's what's going to be really interesting to see here is that the civilizational capital thing. I think when presented, will feel to feel like a really something really big, really big. Mm -hmm. um, and I don't want to get into, and I'm not trying to do some sort of self help whatever uh, kind of program. But what I think we can even bring it down to is the unit of the family. That if you have a family, or you, and not just you and a wife and a kid, but you and parents or you and uh some friends who you or you're you're forming as what you would call a family bond right from that from that base you can do things like you're far you're so far from powerless and so far from screwed in the modern in in, in the situation we have right now it's laughable if if you stay out of jail and maybe even within jail but if you stay out of jail essentially <laughs> you're good like mm -hmm. We're, we're going to be giving you some stuff this year that I think is not just hopeful, not just like uh, poetic and romantic, but actually actionable in people's lives and will bear fruit long after we're gone. And mm -hmm. I, I really tr truly believe that. So, uh, Matt, thanks again, man. Uh, we'll thank pick you. This up it's an honor. Sometime, maybe next week. Uh, we'll get this out uh, on uh, PayPal. Uh, sorry, on. Um, Substack. Uh, just one little note for the Substack crew here. Uh, thank you for everyone who's been joining and and finding their way here. I will be putting out more written copies of things, uh, specifically around Vengeful Sun and gearing up to uh, the civilizational, or I'm calling it the civil uh, grind set. 
we'll figure out a name. It's 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 a work in progress. But keep checking back. Um, this is this whole series will be sort of the 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 carrot, and we're going to be giving some. I want to say sticks. No, we'll be giving more. We'll be giving more carrots. All carrots. Yes, right. it's, it's all carrots. You say like hitting you with them, <laughs> throwing yes. them at you, <laughs> shoving them up in places that you may, maybe <laughs> might be fun enjoyable. I don't know. Uh, it's it's good for your gut. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, it's better for your eyesight. You know, you'll see. You'll see better. 